Have there more people turned up? You just seem to have got bigger. As <laughs> to uh, so the food you've been eating. <laughs> well, I know a number of you are Filipino, and uh, I have been to the Philippines, and I know that you do like snacks. <laughs> I taught a class in uh, Manila uh, of leaders, and uh, they sat around big tables, about eight on each table, and in the middle was always a lot of snacks, and throughout the day, the snacks got less and less. It was a... <laughs> But it didn't distract them. They were very engaged uh, all the way through the day. It was a good week. Um, right. Oh, by the way, um, a number of the books have sold out, unfortunately. Um, for those of you who weren't able to buy them, they weren't very good anyway. So don't feel as if you've missed out. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> some of them I've been trying to sell for years and have struggled. Will you accept the reimbursement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, some of the pages, there's nothing actually written on them. It's just blank, but um, you can draw. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to, that's teasing, obviously. If you wanted to purchase any, it would be a good idea if you got it got together and put an order through, just send me an order and then I can mail it because otherwise it'd be a little expensive to just send individual orders. If you want to do that, we can do that. And if you want to, for your life group, groups, then, then I can do that. Right, now we have about, do we have about an hour, is that okay? Okay, so I will talk very quickly and you will not be allowed to ask uh, any questions. <laughs> um, so what I think we'll do is we will focus on Ephesians, which is what we should have done right from the start, but I got distracted. And I'm just going to focus on some of the verses that Paul um, includes, which refer to the Spirit. Um, and the first one is in chapter one. And uh, I'll just watch my watch and I'll see which other verses we look at. But throughout this letter, he is wanting us to feel good when we realize the Spirit's commitment to us. And the letter is split into two. The first three chapters include information which identifies the positive benefit of the Spirit's involvement in our lives from the moment we become Christians. And then when you get to the end of chapter three, Paul says, Amen which makes us think, oh, that's the end of the letter. But it's not, because chapter 4 is coming. And chapter 4 starts with the word, therefore. In other words, on the basis of what I have said, now there are some consequences or some um, um, responsibilities or some issues that we need to be aware of given all that I have said. They're not bad responsibilities, they're not negative, but they are just, just be aware of this. And uh, he continues to talk about the Spirit in that light. So the first one we're going to look at is in chapter 1, verse 13. If you have your text with me, you can read it. If you don't, don't worry, because I'll just read what Paul says. But the chapter 1 starts with Paul exploring the remarkable nature of our salvation. And from chapter 1, verse 3 to chapter 1, verse 14, in the original Greek, there are no full stops, let alone semicolons. It's just one mass of words. It's as if Paul is so excited about what he is saying that he has no time to slow down. No time for commas or semicolons or colons or full stops. It just tumbles out of him the remarkable nature of our salvation. Not just that we have been forgiven of our sins, not just that we're going to heaven, wonderful though both of those things are, but he then talks about salvation enables you to have a relationship with the creator of the universe, which is the same kind of relationship that Moses had and that Abraham had and that David had. In fact, Paul says it's even better because the Spirit is living in your life and in my life in a way that he wasn't living in David's life and Moses' life and Abraham's life. Wow. 
So the level of intimacy that is available for us as Christians is greater than some of these heroes in the Old Testament. And Paul is so taken up with the remarkable nature of our salvation that this, this waterfall of good news comes out from verse 3 down the way through to verse 14. In verse 3, he actually talks about the blessings that the Spirit gives to us. But more specifically, I'm just going to focus, because of our time, on what he says towards the end, where he says these words. You, who have, number one, heard the word of truth, which is the gospel, and two, you have believed in him, because of that, you have been sealed with the Spirit. So, let's just remind ourselves what he is saying. He is speaking to the people, the Christians, and because this is relevant to us, I can include us. So Paul is saying, you, in Hong Kong, on July 1, 2019, have I got the date right? Yeah. Is it July 2? June 3rd? Is it June the 30th? Not even July. Tomorrow. Oh. Tomorrow. Right. <laughs> so... Paul is saying, you also who have heard the word of truth, yes, we have, we've heard the gospel, and you've believed in Jesus, yes, we have, then, says Paul, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us to explore what it means to be sealed with the Spirit, but before we do, let's remind ourselves of the condition for being filled with the Spirit. It's heard the gospel and you've believed in Jesus. We've done that. We may not have been to Bible college. We may not have been very good Christians. We may not have been Christians for a very long time. We may not be very gifted. We may not be very special people. But if we've heard the gospel and believed in Jesus, that's quite sufficient for Paul to say, you've been sealed with the Spirit. Now, whatever it means, it's something that's happened to all of us. In fact, Paul is referring to that which happens at salvation when the Spirit comes into our lives and begins the partnership with us to the end of our lives and to go to heaven. But why does he use the word seal? Because sealing as a concept doesn't mean very much to me as a 21st century person. I never seal anything. But in the first century, especially if you were a, um, a, a, well, actually Jews and Gentiles, they would use them. Just like you have mobile phones with you everywhere you go, they would have with them seals. And it would generally be a little piece of metal or a piece of alabaster or a little stone or a little cylinder, and you would put it in your pocket. And every time you needed to use it, you would have it available. Why would you use the seal? Ah, well, now this is why it becomes very important. And Paul uses this concept of seal three times in Ephesians and in Corinthians, because these are both cities where commerce is very important. They were cities where factories were present, industries were present, places where you spent money and bought things were very present in these two cities. And it's no surprise that he uses the concept of seal in those cities. So, how would a seal be used? Well, you would use a seal if you wanted to identify that something belonged to you. And so you would put your stamp on it. And archaeologists have discovered many objects and boxes and jewels and trinkets that have been sealed. And the seal would have an impression on them that you put on the wax, and the wax would be put on the object or on the, on the object straight. And it would, in effect, be saying, this belongs to me or this belongs to you. Just in the same way that cattle would be branded with the image of their owner or slaves would have been branded with the image or the initials of their owners the the seal indicated your owned paul says you christians have been owned by god you are owned by god now remember that one of the issues about living in ephesus is that this is a place of great insecurity all around the city of Ephesus, and this is the third major city in the Roman Empire, it's a city of significant prestige, but it is also a city that knows what it is to feel 
um, unstable, destabilized, insecure, worried, worried of invasion, worried of robbers, worried of all kinds of things. So all around the city, 13 kilometers, there's a wall for protection. In the middle of the city, there is a fire which is constantly guarded because the fear is if the fire goes out, the gods of the city will go. So somebody is always guarding the fire. The people in Ephesus are dominated by insecurity. And if they begin to think life after this life, then the insecurity increases because they have no idea what's happening in the life after this life. And bearing in mind that if you lived in Ephesus, you would probably not live beyond 35 years of age. So I've just got one year left. It's that kind of, why do you laugh? If you were living in Rome, you would be lucky to get to 25 because the cities in the first century were incredibly unhygienic and disease when it started just went through the city very quickly and in fact in the summer or in the hot seasons the rich people would leave these cities like Ephesus and Rome and go to the mountains where it was a lot cooler the poor people stayed poorer people died well before they got out of their 20s. So somebody living in Ephesus hasn't got long to live. They don't know what's happening in the next life and they're very uncertain about what's happening in this life. There's not many middle class people in, in Ephesus. They're mainly working class people or below working class. They become Christians and that's been quite a shock to the system because people will accuse them if they are Jews of betraying the faith and if they are Gentiles they will be ridiculed for choosing to follow this God who lives on the other side of the Roman Empire who's a Jew who dies on a cross he was killed by the people that he came to serve you think he's a God well you're nuts so they are ridiculed and marginalized by the people it's not a comfortable road to become a Christian in the first century Paul says listen you need to know something the Spirit has sealed you he, his presence, is God's way of saying, you belong to me. The consequence of that is, in effect, anybody else who seeks to disturb you, anybody who seeks to harm you, be they demonic or be they human, they have to answer to God. It's God's way of saying, don't trespass on territory that doesn't belong to you, because they belong to me. The seal signifies ownership, and the one, of course, who chooses to own us is none other than the creator of the universe. This is a powerful message of security for the Christians. The Spirit's presence in my life means that nothing but nothing can intrude itself upon my life in a way that would indicate that God doesn't know about it. He does. And in his sovereignty, he is in charge of everything that happens to me. And he, if something not good happens to me, it doesn't happen because it was a surprise to him. And he will still take advantage of that for my good because he is that kind of God. Wow. Anything else that the seal signifies? Oh, yes. The seal signifies that that which has been sealed can't be moved by anybody else from where it currently is. So for example, let's imagine that, um, where's Stephen, is he here? There he is. Let's imagine that Stephen is going to the harbor in Ephesus and he's going to purchase some wood because he wants to build something. So what will he do? He will go to the harbor and he will choose the wood he wants and he will put his seal on it. And the fact that his seal is on it means that nobody can purchase that but nobody can move it because it's not theirs, it's his. The message to Paul, through Paul to his people is nobody can do anything to destabilize you, to harm you because you are safeguarded by God. Now, one more thing because there's so much more that I want to say about the spirit, but if you thought about other significant uh, symbolic values of the seal, you would understand why Paul is happy to take advantage of this as a description of the Spirit's involvement in my life. But here's just one more to think about. So here we have some money. 
and um, you will recognize this more than me, but it's a very carefully put together piece of paper with all kinds of designs on it. But you know that if you lift it up, you will see that there is more to this piece of paper than you would ordinarily think because there is a seal that's embedded into this paper. And it is that seal which indicates that this is not just a clever piece of paper, well designed, but this is valuable. The Spirit's involvement in your life and the Spirit's presence in my life is God's way of saying, you are valuable. My response to God is, I don't think I am. God says, no, I have made the decision, you are valued by me as being valuable. But it's as if God says, I know what you like. I know that you will think you're not that special. I know that you will diminish your own sense of importance. So I need spirit for you to get into Keith's life to be a constant reminder that he is truly a child of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. Does that make us arrogant? Does it make us proud? No, it does not. But it does give us a sense of self-confidence that the creator of the universe has affirmed that we are his sons and daughters that he is happy to tell everybody else about. Look at them. He, that's my son. She, that she's my daughter. That's a strange concept, isn't it? To think of God saying that to the angels. I don't, I don't have a biblical verse to say that God does say that to the angels, but it's a logical consequence of what I'm saying. The spirit in me, the spirit in you is God's way of sealing us to say you are valued. You don't seal something that's not valuable. You only seal something that's special, that's precious, that means something to you. And Paul says, that's you Ephesian Christians. Wow. I need to think about this more. Because the more I think about this truth, the more it will help me when I have to deal with issues in my life this week. When issues occur in the office, or in the school, or in the business, or in the workplace, or in the family, or in the community, which destabilize me and make me wonder who's in charge. He's in charge. And the Spirit's presence in my life is evidence of that. Now, he moves on into verse 14, and he says, oh, there's one other thing. The Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. The Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. He actually uses a Hebrew word here that is very common in the Old Testament, and he just puts it into the Greek language, but it fundamentally means that the Spirit is the down payment, the first installment, which functions as a guarantee for our inheritance that we have yet to come. Now, Paul's not so interested in focusing on our inheritance, because I don't know what we are going to be receiving as gifts from God when we get to heaven. Paul does talk about it, but I'm not too sure what gifts I deserve. But then maybe we don't receive gifts because of our deserving of them, but because God enjoys giving, because he loves us. Paul's point is this. The Spirit is in you not just for a few days or for a few weeks. He is committed to be with you. How long? Well, until you finish your time in this earth and until you go to heaven, because that's when you will receive your gift from the Lord. My point is, the Spirit is functioning as a heavenly bodyguard to walk with us throughout our journeys from the moment we become a Christian right through to the end of our lives. That should fill me with a great deal of confidence. It doesn't mean that I say, wow, if that's your level of, comf uh, your com if that's your level of commitment to me, then... I can do a whole pile of sins that I'd never thought about doing before because you are so committed to me. If I think like that, then I need the Spirit to give me a good slap. <laughs> what I should be taking from this is the sense of his determination to ensure that I get to the end of the journey. I want to get to the end of the journey. I'll be doing my best to get to the end of the journey, but the Spirit is saying, listen, Keith, it's not down to you. It's not down to you because it's down to me. And I have already decided the end of your journey, and the end of your journey is going to be with the Father and with Jesus and me. I am the guarantee 
of your inheritance. Wow. Now, if that's wonderful, if I take you over the next page, Paul is now from verse 15 onwards onto another waterfall of good things. But this time, he's praying for them. And he says in verse 17, he says, this is what I'm praying. I'm praying that God will give you a spirit of revelation and wisdom. Now, in your translations, you might have that word spirit with a lowercase s, <clears throat> that God will give you a spirit of revelation and wisdom. The trouble is that there's no capacity within us, like a human part of our spirit or our personality, there's nothing within us that can reveal something that hasn't been revealed. We don't have that ability. We may be wise, but we don't have that ability. And what our translators have often not helped us is that they have forgotten that Paul is still speaking about the spirit with a capital S. You see, the problem in Greek is that the word spirit, which is ponoima, doesn't start with the capital P. In the same way that God in Greek, which is theos, doesn't start with the capital letter theta. Jesus, Jesus, does start with a capital letter because proper names in Greek start with a capital letter, paragraphs start with a capital letter, but no other occasion do you use a capital letter. So if you see Theos, are we speaking about God, capital G, or a so-called God, lowercase g? The context has to decide it. When we see Panoima, are we speaking about the Holy Spirit, capital S, or a spirit, the part of us, a human spirit, lowercase s. The context has to decide it. And when Paul uses penoima in Ephesians, he's always referring to the Holy Spirit. So when he says, this is my prayer, Ephesians, this is my prayer, people in Hong Kong, I'm praying that God will give you the spirit of revelation. Wow, what is it that the Spirit is going to be revealing? It's something that has not been revealed before. That's why he's a spirit of revelation. He's the only one who can give you this kind of information. What is the information? Verse 18, I want you to know what is the hope to which God has called you. This is the revelation that the Spirit is giving to us through these letters. What is the hope that, he's, that we have been called to? This is it. We are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, let me just focus on this. In the previous verse 14, the Spirit was going to be our heavenly bodyguard who was going to walk with us through our lives until we get to heaven. And then when we get to heaven, he says, Father, here's Keith. I've been waiting for you to come, Keith. I'd like you to have your inheritance. Wonderful. Love it. But now in this verse, he says, the Spirit wants to reveal something that is, hasn't been revealed before. That's why it's only the Spirit who can reveal it. And the message is that not you are going to get an inheritance, that's true, but the message is that you are God's inheritance. Me? You? We are God's inheritance? How can that be? How can God view us as being that significant that we can be defined as his inheritance, that which is going to be given to him? It makes no sense. What is so special about us that we should be his inheritance? He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need the angels. He's perfectly self-sufficient. God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But Paul says, here's what I want the Spirit to reveal to you that you are God's inheritance. The saints together are the inheritance of God. I say, I, I, I can't cope with that, Paul. That's just too wonderful for words. I can't believe that, that God is looking forward for me getting to heaven so that he can enjoy me. I always thought heaven was about me enjoying God and about me enjoying heaven and about me enjoying living in a sinless life. Well, that's true. But God is benefiting from our presence in heaven. How can that be? I don't know whether I'll ever understand this because I know that God is completely self-sufficient. I know that he doesn't need me. But he says, I want you to be part of my eternal destiny 
and you are so special that I view, as, view you as my inheritance. Paul says, Spirit, tell those Christians, because they've got a jaundiced view of themselves. They keep looking at, them th at themselves through spectacles that are faded and, and unfocused. They keep thinking that they're not that important. They keep thinking that other Christians are more important than them. They keep thinking that they're failures. They keep thinking that they're never going to be much better than they are. Please tell them that God's perspective is, you are my inheritance. Gracious me. Let me read that again, because I'm not sure that's true. So let me check it again. I'm praying that you might know what is the hope to which he has called you. Now, the trouble with the word hope in English is that it's a kind of a forlorn word. I hope I get back to the hotel tonight, but I don't know. I hope I'm going to be able to lecture tomorrow, but you know, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to. We're never too sure. The word hope is tinged with uncertainty. Whenever hope is used in the Bible, it is certain. So when Paul says, I want you to know the hope to which he has called you, he's meaning, I want you to know that certain, factual, solid, based piece of evidence. This is what he's called you to be. What is that? Servant? No. Son of God? Daughter of God? Yes. But, but, but better than that. Better than that? How can it be better than that? You are his inheritance. Good grief. Oh, and he hasn't even finished. He says, and I want all you, Spirit, to tell them what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. Spirit, tell the Christians just how great is the power that you, Spirit, own. But he doesn't stop there because he says, reveal what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe it's back to us again the spirit's involvement in sealing us is to do all of these good things reminding us of who we are reminding us of what we're going to receive reminding us that god is looking forward to receiving us and then he says on top of that just remember just remind them that because you are with them you have immeasurable greatness in you and you are making that available to them now, how is he going to do that this week? Well, is it going to be that as a result of his immeasurable greatness in us, if we, went if we need to get across to the island, we don't have to cross the ferry, we can walk on the water? Well, I guess he could do that, but it's unlikely that he's going to do that. But he could function in us miraculously. But much more likely, the Spirit is saying, I want you to help me fulfill my ambitions for what I want to do in your factory, in your office, in your business, in your school, in your university, in your community, in your family, in your church. I want you to help me to achieve it. Do I need you? Of course not. I could do it all on my own very easily. But you need to recognize your status as a fellow worker with me. I want us to do things together because that's what we're going to be doing in eternity. But sometimes you need extra resources. No problem, because the spirit who's with you is going to enable you to do it. So be aware this week of the possibility that the spirit will want to involve you in what he wants to achieve and if ever you have to get outside your comfort zone, he's going to enable you to do it. By the way, I don't think the Spirit uses us outside of our comfort zone very often. I think he's much happier to use us in contexts where we are perfectly capable, using us with our gifts and our strengths and our abilities, but on top of that, he enhances them. Okay. Do you want to come back to me on anything I've said? Okay. Now, um, Pastor Rene, one of the rows has completely fallen asleep. <laughs> so do you, do you have a discipline that we'd put on to that? I'm only teasing you. They've all been well awake. <laughs> but I have been a bit prone sometimes that if I see somebody yawning, I say, oh, that's a big yawn. And I stop. I, it's too late. I've said it before I've embarrassed the person. But I haven't had to do that to anybody. And please, feel free to yawn. I, I'm not saying that. Shall we look at one more verse? So now, <laughs> I will not outstay my welcome, but thank you so much for that kind offer. Um, 
I think I'm going to take you to perhaps one of the scariest verses in this letter, if not one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Here it is, it's in chapter 4. Now, there are other references to the Spirit in chapters 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. So, for example, in chapter 2, he speaks about the Spirit being the one who provides access to the Father. We've got to be careful because Paul is using words, and if we take them too literally, we get ourselves into a, a bit of a mix-up. When he says in chapter 2 that the Spirit provides access to the Father, we may think, oh, I thought I could go straight to the Father myself because I'm his son, I'm his daughter. Do I have to go through the Spirit? Is he the one who has to open the door to the Father? Does he knock on the Father's office and say, can Keith talk to you today or not? It sounds as if that's what he's saying. In fact, the book of Hebrews speaks about Jesus being our mediator. Oh, good grief. So if I talk to the Father, do I have to talk to Jesus first and ask for his permission? And then I have to ask Jesus, can you ask the Spirit to ask the Father? Or maybe I have to ask the Spirit to ask Jesus to ask the Father. I thought I could go straight to the Father. No, no, there is a route you go to Jesus first, and then you go to the Spirit, and then you go to the Father. Really? Is that what they're trying to say? I don't think so. Because what he's been saying thus far is that the proximity of the Father to us is incredibly close. So close that you can't put anything between us. So why then are you saying that the Spirit provides access? Well, basically what he's trying to say in this picture is, listen, Keith, if ever you feel that you are too unimportant to trouble God, or if you are coming to say sorry again, or if you are coming to say sorry again for the same sin that you committed not only a couple of days ago, listen, relax, because the Spirit's on your side. Spirit's by your shoulder. And if you're a bit troubled that the Spirit isn't enough, Jesus is there as well. It's not as if the Father is some scary figure that we have to go through Jesus or the Spirit. It's not that he's such a busy being looking after the whole of the universe that we have to book ourselves in through his secretary, the Spirit. No, no, it's not that. It's that the Spirit is constantly the one who is ensuring that we never fall into the trap of thinking he's too busy for us. And what Paul does, I'm sorry, I said we were going into chapter four, but I've got sidetracked, but I've, it's too late. <laughs> Paul uses a very interesting word. This is in chapter two, verse... Um, uh, verse uh, 18. He says, this, this idea of the Spirit gives us access to the Father, the word that he uses is a very clever word. And he doesn't use it anywhere else, but it means something to his Ephesian audience, and that's why he uses it. It doesn't mean much to me as a Western Christian. It will mean something if you are a contemporary African Christian, or indeed a contemporary African person, because the word that Paul uses is a prosagogos. That's the word for the Spirit gives access to the Father. That word access is prosagogos. And he is thinking about an occupation that people undertook in the ancient world and in some contemporary African cultures where a prosagogue introduces somebody to somebody who is more important than them, generally a king or a tribal leader. The prosagogue takes it upon himself to be the one who says, Keith, this is the king. King, this is Keith. It's a picture. It's not meant to be taken literally. The spirit doesn't do that. But here's how Paul amplifies the picture. And you, you need to capture the beauty of the poetry here rather than get, as a 21st century, too bogged down in the analy analysis of it. Paul says that the Spirit is constantly giving access to the Father. He uses the present tense, which in Greek means present continuous. It's not I sit, it's I am sitting. So the picture is that the Spirit is constantly, continuously, never endingly introducing us to the Father. Now, if I take that logically, it's ridiculous. It's me say it's, it's as if the Spirit is saying, Keith, that's your father. Father, that's, that's Keith. Keith, that's your father. Father, that's Keith. Rene, that's your father. Father, that's Rene. Well, that's ridiculous. That's obviously not happening. 
but Paul is saying, that's the picture I want you to understand, that you were never so far away from the Father that the Spirit isn't there as well. It's not as if the Spirit is constantly introducing you to the Father and constantly reminding the Father who you are. That, that's a nonsense. He doesn't need to be reminded. But the picture is that's how close you are. And also, note this, the Spirit is God. How can the Spirit introduce us to the Father? How can he be our mediator? It's as if Paul is saying the Spirit is so close to you that he's closer to you than the Father. So he comes alongside of you and says, come on, we're going to go to the Father. It's a beautiful picture of the proximity of the Spirit to us. Wow. Well, now let me take you over to chapter 4, because I said that we would get there, and I, I will get there, but albeit a little bit later than I'd anticipated. This is a very scary little verse, and troubled me greatly as a Christian for many years, actually. It's in chapter 4, verse 30, and this is what Paul says. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then he says, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's used that same concept, seal, which he's used before. So he says, now that spirit who has sealed you, who has guaranteed you, who has signed his name alongside of you, who's put his reputation on the line by identifying with you, don't grieve him. Can you think of other words for that word grieve? Don't grieve him. Don't sadden him. Don't make him sad. Don't disappoint. Good. Don't bring sorrow. Yeah. Don't discredit him. Quite challenging, these, these different terms. But they're all fair synonyms for this idea of don't grieve. It doesn't say don't irritate him. It doesn't say don't annoy him. But it does indicate that we have the capacity to make the spirit feel sad, dishonored, disappointed. We also have the capacity to make him feel something that he wouldn't feel if it wasn't for us. Which is quite remarkable that God has created us. And in creating us, he opens himself up to experience emotions that he wouldn't have experienced if he hadn't have created humanity. But he does it willingly for our benefit and for the benefit that he and we can have. So let's come back to the verse, don't grieve the spirit. Oh, not just don't grieve the spirit, Paul uses this unique description of the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only time he uses the term. Paul is seeking to help the Christians realize that all that the Spirit has done for them, is doing for them, will do for them, does have a significant consequence. He's not bringing them into guilt, as I will be exploring with you in a moment. But he is wanting them to be cognizant that this is a remarkable privilege that they've been offered, that we have been offered. And our response is, Keith, just don't hurt him. Don't sadden him. Don't disappoint him. Don't discredit him, because you can. You can. He's not an object of stone. He has feelings, and you can hurt those feelings. Now, very interestingly, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. Now, we don't realize that because we're not Jewish people. But if a Jewish person was to read that, they would automatically, because they know the Old Testament very well, they would automatically think about a a statement in Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 10, where this same phrase is used, and it is used of the children of Israel, who Isaiah says, they grieved the Holy Spirit of God. Paul is saying, don't be like the children of Israel, who did exactly the same thing. They grieved the Holy Spirit of God. But here's the difference. Isaiah 63, verse 10 says, the children of Israel grieved the Holy Spirit of God and he laid them waste in the wilderness. Wow. So as a result of what the children of Israel did in terms of hurting God, the consequence was that God responded very significantly to them and they died in the wilderness. Paul, you've left out the consequence. You've not told us what the Spirit is going to do. Maybe it's too horrible that you didn't like to tell us, and that's why you've left it out. 
But I don't think that's where Paul is coming from at all. Paul, Paul doesn't say, don't grieve the spirit, because if you do, then goodness knows what's going to happen to you. He doesn't say that. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You see, the picture for Paul is, the worst thing about grieving the Holy Spirit of God is not the punishment that you might receive. The worst thing is that you've grieved the Spirit because you've grieved somebody who has committed himself to you. You've grieved your friend. You've grieved your best friend. It's a little bit like me um, breaking the law when I went to the airport. I went faster than the speed limit. I broke the law. I grieved the law, but the law didn't really care because it doesn't have any feelings. But if I was nasty to my wife on the way, then that would be very different because I've hurt somebody who has demonstrably chosen to love me and she has dedicated herself to me. I am very differently grieving her. And it looks as if Paul is saying to me, Keith, just remember that this wonderful, remarkable spirit who's on your side, you do have the capacity to hurt him. Please be careful. Don't do that. Oh, I still find it quite a scary verse, but I find it a verse that is sobering. Not because the Spirit is going to do something negative to me in response, but it just helps me realize he's so committed to me, the least thing I can do is try not to hurt him. The question is, how do I hurt the Spirit? Well, presumably, it means don't murder people. And thankfully, I haven't murdered that many people this week, so I'm okay on that score. Or maybe it means you don't steal something that's a lot of money, or you don't do something really big. Well, it's very interesting what it means to grieve the Spirit, because Paul does tell us. <laughs> he says, um, it's in the next verse, don't be bitter, don't be angry, don't be nasty to each other, don't be malicious. Grieving the Spirit for Paul is to do something that's going to hurt the unity of friendship with Christians. Interesting. For Paul, pleasing the Spirit is when you are kind to one another as Christians, when you build each other up. Being grieving of the Spirit is when you undermine unity by being harmful, by being hurtful, by being gossiping. Whoa! I might not have murdered many people, but I've said some things that I wish I hadn't, and I've thought some things that might have worked out in my language to other Christians. Oh, I've hurt you, Spirit. I never realized that you were that sensitive to those aspects of character development. Oh, yes. Well, how can I please you? Well, I'll tell you, Paul says, you can please the Spirit, verse 32, by being kind to one another. Was well, as simple as that. I thought I had to um, do something really miraculous. Well, that, that helps, but... Just be kind, be tender-hearted, be forgiving. That's how you please the Spirit. Huh. This notion of unity is so important that Paul says, Christians maintain the spirit of unity that the Holy Spirit has initiated. Jesus, John 17, his longest prayer, Father, please keep them one. And what's happened in the centuries that have followed Christians we split apart from each other so regularly and if from the Pentecostal tradition like myself we've split apart from one another in so many ways and uh, it's a great shame because unwittingly to many of us we've hurt the spirit now have we got time for one more yes, yes we have it's only seven o'clock so verse um, <laughs> I know it's not one more verse, and this is a very well-known one to you, but it's worth um, mentioning it. This is in chapter 5, verse 18. We'll just look at this one and one more, just so you know where we're going. This is the verse that says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, um, I was at a conference a little while ago, and there were about 300 Pentecostal ministers there. And before my talk, I said, how many of you are filled with the Spirit? And they all put their hands up, which I expected them to do. And then I said, um, thanks very much. I just want to let you know that I'm not filled with the Spirit. So many of them knew me, and so there was a little bit of consternation as to, oh, <laughs> we thought you were filled with the Spirit. And I still say I am not filled with the Spirit, but I'll explain to you why I say that. Because sometimes we use this term, filled with the Spirit, inappropriately. 
By the way, you notice that Paul doesn't say be full of the Spirit because there's no notion of anybody ever being full of the Spirit unless you think of Jesus. But before we even go that far, we need to ask the question, why, Paul, do you speak about being filled with the Spirit? It's a fairly unhelpful metaphor. Being filled with, I mean, how am I going to get the Spirit in me to fill me up? Do I have to open my mouth? <laughs> open my mouth, breathe him in, breathe him in. That's the way to get the Spirit in. Or open your mouth, get him in through your mouth or any other orifice in your body. That's, he's got to fill you. Well, what if I'm thin? Does that mean that he's a bit squashed? Does it help if I'm a bit bigger? And then he's got more room to, to move within me. Paul is using a metaphor that isn't very helpful in a 21st century context. So let's come back to the first century. Luke, in his gospel, speaks about a man who comes to meet with Jesus, and Luke says he is full of leprosy. Full of leprosy. Full of leprosy, what do you mean? Just call him a leper, say he's leprous. But in the context of the first century, being full of something means that that which you are full of dominates your being. If you are full of leprosy, you are completely leprous. It dominates who you are, it identifies who you are. Right, I got it. Luke in the book of Acts speaks about a sorcerer, a man called Elymas. And he says, that man is full of deceit. Full of deceit. Just call him deceitful, or very deceitful, or incredibly deceitful. But in the first century context, being full of deceit creates the picture that is needed to be created. He is completely corrupt. He's full of corruption, full of deception. It's in that respect that Paul says, Christians, I want you to be filled and he's speaking continuously, continuously be being filled with the Spirit. In other words, let your lives resonate the presence of the Spirit. Let the Spirit be the dominating force in your life. Let him be the controlling influence in your life. Let him be the one who guides you. Oh, right, okay. Now I ask the question to my 300 ministers, are you filled with the Spirit? Is he your constant guiding influence? Are you taking advantage of him whenever he wants you to take advantage of him? Are you constantly listening, listening to him and walking in step with him? No. We would love to be there, but we are not there. Paul says, well, that's fine. I'm not expecting you to be perfect. I'm not expecting you to be completely dominated by the Spirit in the way that Jesus was. But that's why I'm saying be constantly in the process of letting him be controlling of you being the guiding influence in, in your life. How, how do I do that? Well, I'll come back to that. But notice the contrast that he offers. He says, don't be drunk with wine. That leads to debauchery. That's a stupid thing to do. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Well, there's no evidence that the Ephesian Christians were getting drunk with wine. It's not, that's, not that they're, that's not the major sin in Ephesus. Paul is drawing the contrast, I'm sure you'll appreciate this, between... Well, you know what happens when somebody is drunk with wine or beer or any kind of liquor. Their personality gets squashed because the beer or the wine that is influencing them takes over. And they start doing things that they wouldn't have done if they hadn't have been drinking. They might do all kinds of things because the wine is controlling their lives. It's filling them literally, but is manifesting itself in their lifestyles and their characters. Now, Paul says, you've got the picture. Wine is filling them and it results in this. Let the Spirit fill you because that will result in this. We just got to be careful that we don't misunderstand. He's not saying, so drink the Spirit in. Because the Spirit is not a liquid. He is a force, but he is a friend. He is a personality. He can't be drunk. I can remember being brought up as a Christian and hearing my leaders saying, now listen, when you're out in the office or when you're out amongst your non-Christian friends, and by the time you come home, the spirit will have leaked out. It's just leaked out of you. <laughs> and so you, you just got to go get another fill-in. All right, okay, how do I do that? Well, you just got, I don't know, you do it, but you just got to get more of the spirit in you because he's leaked out of you. What a load of nonsense. Spirit can't leak anywhere. The spirit is a being. He is not a liquid. He's energetic, but he is not some kind of vacuous force. 
Paul is using a picture to describe the controlling influence of the Spirit in our lives. Now, here's the, here's the evidence. How do I know whether somebody is filled with the Spirit? Well, Paul, are you going to help me? Because you're telling me that it's important that I be continually allowing the Spirit to influence me. How do I know when the Spirit is sufficiently influencing me that I can feel a little happier with who I am? Is it because I've reached a level of spirituality or I've been to Bible college or I speak in tongues or I've been baptized with the Spirit as a secondary experience? Are those the evidences? Well, Paul doesn't mention that at all. This is what Paul says. Um, so you want to be filled with the Spirit? Next verse. You'll be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Now, I don't suspect that Paul is trying to say, if the Spirit is controlling you, every time you're out in the streets, you're singing Christian songs and choruses out loud. I'm sure he's not saying that. But he is expressing the notion, if the Spirit is controlling you, if you're walking in step with the Spirit, if you and the Spirit are together, you're listening to him, he's speaking to you, and you're hearing him and putting his words into operation, your life will be dominated by joy. It'll be God with joy right okay anything else yes next verse in everything you'll be giving thanks to the name of the lord jesus christ oh so thanksgiving will be part of your lifestyle if the spirit is participating with you anything else oh good grief verse 21 be subject to one another well i'm not overly keen about that because the fact of the matter is there are some people in my christian community who are wrong and if you're telling me I have to be subject to them, well, I'm sorry, but I won't be subject to them. Well, Paul says, well, if the Spirit is controlling you, then you will be learning to agree to disagree and still live in partnership and unanimity with those people. Whoa. Because the Spirit is the one who determines whether you are filled with the Spirit, not you yourself. And others should see the difference. Anything else? Oh, verse 22. Good one. Ah, where's Judy? She needs to know this. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. That's the evidence that you are being filled with the Spirit. If you wives are subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Let me say that again. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. That's the evidence that the Spirit is filling you and controlling you and influencing you. But look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Whoa, really? <laughs> Oh, no, not, not just love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Good grief. That's a very high calling. I'm not too sure I can get anywhere near that, Paul. Well, that's the evidence of the Spirit filling you, Keith. If he's influencing you, you are going to be loving Judy. You are going to be taking her out for a meal from time to time. You are going to be telling her that you love her more than you might think you ought. You are going to be giving her some flowers and roses and Valentine's cards and anniversaries. <laughs> All kinds of very practical things. And I think Paul is very practical. He might not have used those examples because we're talking over a first century context. But he is actually saying, spirit controlling your life? What's the evidence? Well, I did a prophecy a couple of weeks ago. I did a miracle. I healed somebody. Well, that's not on my list. My list has, were you nice to people? Were you nice to your wife? Were you nice to your husband? Children, he goes on, are you obeying your parents? Parents, he goes on, especially dads, he says, are you caring for your children? Do you see what he's saying? Evidence of being filled with the Spirit is something that's going to make a difference to our characters, our lifestyles, and other people will notice it. It's not appropriate for me to say, I'm filled with the Spirit because I'm referring to an experience that I might have received 10, 20, 30 years ago. Being filled with the Spirit is evidence that the Spirit is changing me, transforming me, walking with me. Last one. This is towards the end of chapter 6, where Paul mentions the Spirit twice. And this is where he's talking about the armor that he suggests we put on. It's another of his pictures to try and help us remember our status as Christians. And when we get to verse 17, he says, now, two things. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What is the sword of the Spirit? Well, he's thinking about a sword that the Roman soldier uses, and he says, now, that's like the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the word of God. What's the word of God? Well, you say, it's the Bible. Well, kind of, except when Paul said this, there was no New Testament. Hadn't been written. 
This very letter to Ephesians had not been identified as a letter that was from God for all time. So whatever he's speaking about when he speaks about the word of God, he can't be speaking about the New Testament because it wasn't compiled as a New Testament until 400 years later. Well, is he speaking about the Old Testament? Well, yes, of course, that's the word of God to the Jewish people and it can benefit the Christians. But Paul is meaning, meaning much more than even the Old Testament. He's meaning much more than even the Old Testament and the New Testament. What Paul is saying is this, Christians, Christians, the spirit is in your lives. He's doing you a power of good, but he is there also to enable you to do a power of good for others. So when God wants you to say something, the spirit is your sword. The spirit will give you the words to say. Well, what do you mean? In a word of prophecy or in a word of revelation? Well, yes, but also when you're counseling somebody, when you're preaching, when you're teaching young people or Sunday schools, when you are in your office working with non-Christians or people who are close to becoming a Christian or whatever, the Spirit will enable you to say something to them that is just right for them at that given time. You are the mouthpiece, the mouthpieces of the Spirit. He could drop the words directly into the minds of the people concerned, but he would rather use us to be involved in the process. So when you, this week, will get the sense of, oh, maybe I should ask that person how they're feeling, or would this person like a cup of coffee, or would you mind if I prayed for you? These thoughts that drop into our minds, be open to the possibility that that is the spirit just dropping a thought into your mind. You might say, oh, well, I don't know whether it was the Spirit. I just thought it was a thought that came into my mind. Fine. If it's a good thought that's come into your mind, then there's no reason why you can't say that that was a Spirit-given thought that's come into my mind. If a thought came into your mind, I want to kill my boss, that's probably not from the Spirit. <laughs> but if it's something that is good, then take advantage of that and say, Thank you, Spirit. I'm going to do that because I'm sensing that what you are doing is enabling me to speak as your prophet, your prophetess, as your mouthpiece instead of you. And then the last thing he says, oh, and by the, by the way, pray at all times in the Spirit. What does that mean? Does it mean pray in tongues? Well, if it means pray in tongues, he would have said pray in tongues. He doesn't say pray in tongues. He says pray in the Spirit. And anyway, if I pray in tongues, does that mean that that's better than praying in English? I don't think so. Is it somehow that when you pray in tongues, it gets the message to God quicker? Is it going like a super highway to God in tongues? Well, if that's true, that's a real problem for those people who can't speak in tongues. And Paul says, not all speak in tongues, do they? So Paul seems to be quite aware of the fact that there are many Christians in the first century who don't speak in tongues, and he doesn't put pressure on them to speak in tongues. So if it's a reference to speaking in tongues, I've got a real problem as to why Paul is speaking of this particular valuable experience of speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues. I'm not de denigrating it at all. But is there something else that he's saying? Well, yes, I think he is. I think he's saying, listen, Keith, when you pray, remember that the spirit who's with you is there not just to help you to speak to others and help them in your counseling or preaching and teaching and conversing and evangelizing, but he is there to help you when you speak to God, when you pray to God. Oh, I thought it was just down to me. No, well, it's not down to you. In fact, the role of the spirit is to help us to pray the right prayer. Because how do I know in a given situation whether the prayer that I'm praying is the right prayer? So, for example, when I pray for people who are sick, and I'm very happy to pray for people who are sick, I will be saying to them, what would you like me to pray for? And then I say, let's ask the Lord to give us guidance as to what he might wish us to pray. Because he might have a preference for that prayer which might be different to my preference. It could be that that person who is sick God's desire is that they be healed like that. It could be that God's preference is that they be healed over a period of time. It could be that that sickness is caused by something in their lives that needs to be sorted out first. We have examples of that in the New Testament. It could be that that person 
is not going to be touched God by God with a healing response, and they are going to stay in that condition, but God will support them with his grace, which is exactly what happened to Paul. And if I simply pray for that person with the first thing that comes into my mind, it, must be, it may be most unhelpful to them. I need to keep one ear open to what the Spirit is saying to help me. Now, if the Spirit doesn't give me any guidance, and I don't often get words from the Lord, but if I don't get any sense of influence as to the way I should be praying, then I will pray as best I can on the basis of the knowledge that I have, but always under the recognition that God's will is in control. But the message that Paul is saying is, Christians, the Spirit is in you to do you good, but he is there to partner you, not in a scary way, not in a an empowering way that's going to leave you feeling a bit nervous or shaken. But whenever you are doing speaking out, Spirit's going to help you. Just be open to the possibility that he might help you. And when you are speaking up to God, be open to the possibility that he might help you in the process of getting the prayer right in the first place. He is much more on our side than we might realize. He's much more on our side than we might dream of. He is much more on our side than we deserve. He is more committed to us speaking something good to somebody else than we might think, and he is more desirous of helping us pray the right prayer to God than we might imagine. And so Paul comes to the end of his time together by in effect saying, so there we have it. Spirit is in your life to be your best friend, to be on your side, on your side, not just by your side, on your side. And even when you mess up and you hurt him, it's very different to the Old Testament when God reacted negatively. In the New Testament, there's no concept other than in the book of Acts when God will react like that. The, the challenge is that we don't hurt him because we've hurt somebody who has demonstrably chosen unilaterally to love us. And then he says, and on top of all of that, when you want to say anything, Spirit wants to help you say the right thing. And when you want to pray anything, Spirit's there to help you pray the right thing. This is truly a remarkable spirit. Um, so I'm just going to pray, but then we've got a couple of minutes you might want to talk. Father, when we think about your involvement in our lives and our salvation, we cannot help but be awestruck by this wonderful salvation that you have granted to us. What an unworthy group of people we are. What an unworthy individual I am to receive such an outflow of love from you, which, which never stops and was, uh, was existing even before I was born. And the moment that I came into a relationship with you, that waterfall of goodness flooded into my life. And, and I know that we've not anywhere near understood just the depth of your graciousness to us and maybe that's why we have, we have eternity maybe there we'll understand it to a greater and greater degree but thank you so much that you have called us to a developing exploration of the spirit and thank you spirit for your readiness and openness to to walk with us and to allow us to walk with you our request is given that we know our slowness to believe these truths because they're so wonderful, given our sinfulness as human beings, would you help us nevertheless, if you don't mind, to, to walk with you? Help us to keep in step with you. We invite you to be more proactive where we are a little slow um, to do that. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Do you want to pick up anything I've said? Yeah. You mentioned in terms of the um, word picture in the sense of our spirit being in the body torturing someone else and working as a soul. What is the word picture? Why is it specifically a soul? And how does that reflect in terms of yes. Yes, good, good question. The word that he uses for sword um, is an interesting one because it's, the, it's a short dagger rather than a big long thing. So 
if I'm going to develop anything from Paul there, and I'll have to check with him when I get to heaven, it looks as if he's saying, in those occasions when you are in a position of attack, you are being attacked. Remember that the spirit is there to help you in a defense mode, to help you with how you respond. And it may be that he is thinking about where Jesus says to his disciples, he says, when you are brought before the authorities and you don't know what to say, it's okay. I'll be there to help you. So maybe Paul is thinking about those occasions when the Spirit can help you to defend your status as a Christian. What I have done is taken a step beyond that and said that if it's valuable there, then I think it's also valuable in other contexts. You will have to decide whether you think that what I've done is valid. Where I would also suggest that in other settings where we speak, the Spirit's role is to come and help us in that regard. So if I'm counseling, if I'm evangelizing, if I'm talking, if I'm listening to somebody, how do I know how to respond in, in response to what they say? I want to believe that the Spirit is there to help me. See, I think Lucky Stop is waiting. Oh, well, we have a question. I want to ask, in terms of, um, as a Christian, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, Okay. Individually. Yeah. How that is it is it wrong that you were okay. So when you 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 felt when you feel with the spirit, yeah. then you were seeking in a higher level that you felt you see God face to face, yeah. It's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. It's efficient, right? It won't happen all the time. Yeah. So is that something No, no, it's not wrong. Um, I think if anything, if we can draw anything from what Paul is saying, he's saying, listen, go with our blessing. It's been good to have you. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, it's fine, no problem. Um, I think if Paul is saying anything, is he's saying, when it comes to speaking to humanity, the Spirit wants to help you. He's just said that, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. When you want to speak to God, the Spirit's gonna help you. In other ways, in other words, in any way you use your voice to God or to man, the Spirit's role is to help you. So if you feel that God wants you to spend more time with him for a given reason, and you feel the Spirit is guiding you in that regard, say, thank you, Spirit, for helping me. If you're in a situation where you are praying for a given situation and you don't know whether to go this way or that way, ask the Spirit to help you in the process. Because James says, if you need wisdom, James chapter 1, if you need wisdom, ask and you will receive it. There's the promise. You will receive the wisdom. So um, I think that's what he's fundamentally saying. The spirit is intimately desirous of being involved in all aspects of your life, as far as the tongue is concerned, to humanity, or to God. Right, so what's this funny word we've got now at 5.30? Hop, hop. Potluck. Potluck, is that what it's no, called? Excuse me. Pot providence, is it, or something? It's like bring and share. Bring and share, that's the Christian way to describe it. Bring and share. Not lucky pot. <laughs>